So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori, Creativity, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or over on my website at www.josiesartschool.com. I'd like to start with some words from a book called The Creative Habit by Twyla Tharp. I'm a dancer and a choreographer. Over the last 35 years, I've created 130 dances and ballets. Some of them are good, some less good. That's an understatement. Some were public humiliations. I worked with dancers in almost every space and environment you can imagine. I've rehearsed in cow pastures. I've rehearsed in hundreds of studios, some luxurious in their austerity and expansiveness, others filthy and gritty with rodents literally racing around the edges of the room. I've spent eight months on a film set in Prague, choreographing the dances and directing the opera sequences for Milos Forum's Amadeus. I've staged sequences for horses in New York City's Central Park for the film Hair. I've worked with dancers in the opera houses of London, Paris, Stockholm, Sydney, and Berlin. I've run my own company for three decades. I've created and directed a hit show on Broadway. I've worked long enough and produced with sufficient consistency that by now I find not only challenge and trepidation, but peace as well as promise in the empty of a white room. It has become my home. As many, after so many years, I've learned that being creative is a full-time job with its own daily patterns. That's why writers, for example, like to establish routines for themselves. The most productive ones get started early in the morning when the world is quiet, the phones aren't ringing, and their minds are rested, alert, and not yet polluted by other people's words. They might set a goal for themselves, write 1,500 words, or stay at their desk until noon. But the real secret is that they do this every day. In other words, they are disciplined. Over time, as the daily routines become second nature, discipline morphs into habit. It's the same for any creative individual, whether it's a painter finding his way each morning to the easel, or a medical researcher returning daily to the laboratory. The routine is is much part of the creative process as the lightning bolt of inspiration. Maybe more. And this routine is available to everyone. Creativity is not just for artists. It's for business people looking for new ways to close the sale. It's for engineers trying to solve a problem It's for parents who want to help their children to see the world in more than one way. Over the past four decades, I have been engaged in one creative pursuit or another every day, in both my professional and my personal life. I thought a great deal about what it means to be creative and how to go about it efficiently. I've also learned from the painful experience of going about it in the most worst possible way. I'll tell you about both. I'll give you exercises that will challenge some of your creative assumptions 
to make you stretch, get stronger, last longer. After all, you stretch before you jog, you loosen up before you work out, you practice before you play. It's no different for your mind. From Flora Boley's book, Brave Intuitive Painting. Barbara DeAngelis says, The moment in between once you, what you once were and who you are now becoming is where the dance of life really takes place. Based on past life experiences, opinions we've been taught to accept as truths, and stories we've decided to believe along the way, we all go through life with different beliefs about who we are and what we are capable of doing in this lifetime. We may or may not consider ourselves to be creative, and calling ourselves artists may be an even greater stretch. I grew up with the belief that only a select group of people could actually be artists, and surely I was not one of them. However, I kept following my deepest calling and I continually found myself making art. Slowly and steadily, my belief system about creativity and being an artist dramatically shifted. I now understand that human aliveness is inseparable from creativity. We are all artists already each and every one of us. Human aliveness is inseparable from creativity. I believe that creativity and intuition are intimately connected. We were born with and continue to possess deep wells of inner wisdom and creative impulses, just waiting to be listened to and acted on. The key to unlocking these inherent creative forces begins with letting go of the fear and negative stories that hold us back in order to make space for the new positive stories to emerge. The first step is to recognize what stories are creating your life right now. Notice what kind of self-talk is playing like a broken record in your mind. Do you tell yourself you are unable to let go creatively? Do you allow fear of failure to keep you from starting new projects altogether? Are you ready to soften this voice in your head? Choose affirming thoughts and step into a new way of approaching your work that is gentle, fun, and forgiving? From Daniel Laporte's book, White Hot Truth. Faking self-love to get more love for other, from others. Such a clever survival tactic. Fake self-love might be another way of saying false pride. We can shout, I love my curves. I love my crazy. I love my attitude. All the while... We're looking out of the corner of our eye to see if everyone else is loving us for our curves, our crazy, our attitude. If I love me, then maybe you will love me, right? Not necessarily. Because humans are really messed up about love. Beautifully, irresistibly, and understandably so messed up about love. You can try to love yourself in spite of not being loved the way you want to be. You don't dig me? Well, I'll show you how fantastic I am. And actually, that approach can be somewhat effective because while you're proving your fabulosity to everyone, you might start seeing and believing it for yourself. But you're still going to have to get past the layers of self-disdain to get to the warm center of your true adoration, like the self-love Tootsie Pop. Eventually, you must love yourself just because of, well, 
yourself. You're beautiful, luminous, powerful, magnificent, righteous, sacred self. Signs that you love yourself. In her warm and plain talking way, Buddhist nun Pima Children talks about how many of us spend years taking good care of ourselves with exercise and diet regimens. We get our massages, do our spiritual practices and various forms of meditation. But when we're really challenged by life, we still don't have true self-love to draw on. All those years don't seem to have added up to that inner strength and kindness for themselves that they need to relate with what's happening. When we start to develop unconditional acceptance of others and of ourselves, then we're really taking care of ourselves in a way that pays off. A way that pays off. A way that builds inner strength instead of outer dependencies. A way that expands us so we can accommodate more pain and more joy. A way that grows us. Deep growth happens when our self-care is a celebration of our goodness and value. And not a fixation on what needs to be fixed. It's a life-affirming attentiveness that steers us inward for the answers. Eventually we stop looking for signs from the universe that we are loved, and we start finding signs everywhere that we love ourselves. <laughs>